Kia ora everyone and welcome to Comfy Christchurch, uh, as we're now known. Uh, we just coined that term, Frith coined that term in the last five minutes for us. It's under your tagline, so thank you, Frith. Um, yeah, so it's great to be here. We wanted to do a bit of a southern session uh, for you as part of Placemaking Week, and it's nice to do it as a full stop to, uh, I think, what's been a really good week of getting together over um, the Zoom, but talking about what's going on in the country and how we grow the Aotearoa network. Um, so it's a privilege today to talk uh, with my neighbours, my community, and I should say that we were going to have more, but I'd forgotten that it's Canterbury Anniversary Day when I said yes to doing this. Uh, and so some of my neighbours have gone away and Simon has to leave at one to go to Hamner Springs. So we'll crack on and we'll get some good stuff out of it. And hopefully at the end, we'll have a bit of time for questions and sort of talking. So um, yeah, I, I pitched this um, session as sort of becoming a zealous nut. And I, I like that term. I heard it, I think Fred Kent and Ethan Kent had used it um, a few years ago talking about community placemakers or people who get a bit of fire underneath them and think, right, I can change this and I can do something and I can become action orientated. And in our community here in Beckenham, so we're in Christchurch, just about 3k south of the central city, just nestled below the hills. Um, we've started a bit of a project um, out of the Innovating Streets program. And I think the project started with streets, but is growing into much more than that as it sort of catches fire in the community and a lot of projects come out. So I wanted to talk to community members who aren't the usual urban professionals, I suppose, um, who you know have been talking during the week or we normally engage with about what it is for them and what is placemaking, what's this project all about. And then hopefully for urban professionals listening and some community members, how do we keep building this uh, in our communities that this is something that's not just left in councils or consultancies or NGOs, it's actually community members being part of this. And hopefully there's some, some lessons for people and there's some things that we can do. So uh, I'll want to do this interview. I don't want to talk all day. So I want to welcome um, two of my neighbourhood colleagues. Um, so Simon Kingham, who lives... Um, around the corner from me. I live in Sandwich Road and he lives on Fisher Ave. And Ashley Beaton, who um, is, is now part of our neighbourhood, but is actually our student intern from the university who's been working with us. So um, Simon, do you want to start with who you are? Yeah. So Mike said, my name is Simon Kingham. I'm a resident of Beckenham. I've lived in Beckenham for five years. And before that, I lived about 200 metres um, away. So I've been in the area a long time. I teach geography at the University of Canterbury as well so that's my day job um but i'm also a passionate resident of where i live great ashley yeah so um my name is ashley i study masters of urban resilience and renewal at u the university of canterbury and i was lucky enough to have this better beacon project as my internship over my second semester and i've just grown to love it that now i haven't left <laughs> but yeah great and um, maybe tell us a little bit about the Bed of Beckenham project and how it on earth started and mm -hmm. where it grew from. So this project, um, I guess Mike and I live in the neighbourhood and our, our, the third original member of our team is a guy called Dave Kelly, who's, who was in the Neighbourhood Association. And Mike and I kind of separately heard about the Innovating Streets project, but Mike showed a bit more initiative and actually said that we should try and get something into this. So um, he... Well, between us, we contacted the council and they said, if you give us some information uh, by the end of today, we will look to submit for funds um, and we'll consider Beckenham as an option. So Mike wrote something, I tweaked it. We've actually, I've had a few student projects over the years um, looking at some transport and community related issues in Beckenham. Um, so we added a bit of, we had a bit of research to back up the sort of things we were arguing. Um, so we tweaked it, we sent it to council Council included it in their application to the Innovating Streets Fund, and we got the funding. So that's kind of how it started. Um, we then started meeting and started talking about what we were going to do. We then brought Ashley in. So as Ashley has explained, she's a student intern, so she's doing her did her internship on this project, and it kind of went from there. Mm. And I think I mean one of the things I've been amazed at is the the amount of people that are in the neighbourhood all of a sudden have got the passion for it, I think, you know, triggered with something. But then we have Maurice, who's not here today, who's got a marketing background. She's come out and said, look, I'll, I'll build you a website. We've had landscape gardeners and artists and all sorts of people coming in. So, Ashley, mm -hmm. um, how, how do we, and I, I, there's some <laughs> questions I didn't want me to ask, but how do we um, 
Well, how have you found the community re reaction, I think, first of all, and how do we keep growing that? What are some things that we can keep doing to grow that? Yeah, so I think something key that we did at the start, well, I started engaging with the school children at the schools in the area, so that kind of got the conversation starting at home as well, and the kids were working on possible projects that we could use in the innovating streets, and which in turn their parents obviously had to help them because some of them were five. Um, and it kind of started that conversation and then it's just kind of grown from there. We had some events at the school and then we've um, just grown on like the neighbourhood Facebook page and just general chit chat, I guess. It's just word of mouth has kind of grown from, we've been lucky enough to work with school outwards and then there's just, yeah, I feel like everyone's just flooding in now. Yeah. And, and is there things that we could do more well, you could do more of you think we could do more of to activate more people or get more people involved yeah i guess we've at the moment we've kind of sat on a lot of like online presence as we've like done marketing things like that we've done a few like um billboards that we've put up when we're having an event but i think the next steps for us as we move especially in the innovating streets of getting more people engaged is doing like um letter drops to people with just we flyers um, just because some of the older community don't really sit online or they find it inconvenient or anything like that. Or some people just won't be on Facebook because they don't want to be. So we just want to just hit everyone. But. I think the key, actually, you mentioned this, actually went into the school. So we've engaged with the school kids. But the other big organisation in the community is actually a residential home. So it's an old people's home. And we haven't really, it'd be great to, to work with them more overtly. And I guess that's just time and resource that's not. But mm -hmm. the school work's been, been amazing. Mm -hmm. But that's the other big community, I think. Yeah, yeah. And what about um, people who haven't wanted to engage or have been a little bit upset or grumpy? Like, how, I mean, I suppose, have there been stories like that? And how have you or how as a community sort of dealing with that um, in the bigger scheme of things in the project? This, I guess yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> something that's always nice to do is um, kind of to kill them with kindness and open arms. Um, so someone can't really come at you um, and say that you weren't open to talking to them if you, as soon as they've kind of reached out a negative feedback or left negative feedback on Facebook or by email, is reaching back out to them quite quickly. Um, and it's not to shut them down, but it's to communicate to kind of understand where they're coming from, because um, they are a valued member of the neighbourhood and they're a stakeholder that lives there. So their voice is just as important as the person who lives next door to them and wants it to happen. So it's, I guess, bringing them, sometimes it's just miscommunication, sometimes it's, they just, I don't know, someone once tried to do something years ago and they're just against it, you know? And I think that's... And it's also yeah. selling, I think it's selling the big vision. Yeah. So there was one community member who we were told might be a problem, but when Dave met them on the street and talked about how what we're trying to do is make the street safer, we're trying to, we would like to reduce speeds, we want to make it safer for kids to cross. They were totally on board with that. Mm. Cool. And once you start, so once you sell the big vision and get everyone on board with the big vision, then when you put the detail in, they understand what the detail's doing, even if it might affect the ability for them to park outside their house, they can see the big vision and go, well, actually, I'll back that big vision. Cool. And I, th I think that, that that's a nice little story, actually. So Dave, our neighbour who's not here, he's on holiday, but he was out measuring the street um, to look at the, the things that we were starting to plan to do. And that's where the neighbour came out of his house and mm. then started to engage and was the neighbour that we had been told would be harder to engage or would be anti it. But I think that conversation being in the place and on the street helped break a lot of those barriers. So. And it's, it's that one-to-one -one time. Yeah. So I think we've tried using social media a bit and it's quite easy for people to be slightly anti on social media, but when you actually talk to them, and we've tried to talk to some others so we thought might be troublesome, when you actually talk to them and they see the vision, I think they, they understand it yeah. and everyone backs it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so I think, what, what are, so thinking bigger, what are some of the bigger challenges for, say, our colleagues up north or around the South Island or overseas for getting communities involved? Like, um, how, how do they help people catch the fire who might not? already have it. Is there some things that they could do? Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things we did um, is, is we had this student project a couple of years ago asking people what the issues were. And people talked about, not we don't have a lot of traffic in our community, but people do say that sometimes the traffic's quite fast. We've done a project in the past where we've talked to kids and kids have talked about finding it difficult to cross the road. 
And so we've got people interested saying these are some of the issues we want to deal with. Mm. And I think once you start with that bigger picture, then people can understand the detailed projects, as we mentioned, might mm. affect something very close to them. They can understand it. So I think it's almost starting with a blank slate and saying, what are the things that you can, what do you like about your community? And what, what don't you like? Do you want to mention some of the, the event we did at the school where we asked and the maps and the questions? Yeah, did? so one of the first events, I guess, that we have for uh, the Innovating Streets project is we um, got some big A0 maps of the neighbourhood, stuck them around outside. We were lucky enough to have a barbecue outside. Um, and we pretty much just asked people, what do you like about Beckenham and what do you think needs improved? And just gave them post-it notes and they could just kind of write down like ideas that they had and they could just stick it up and from there it's amazing how many common themes come out so I think we have like 180 responses of things that people would like to see improved but really when you read those comments and distill them probably there's actually only like 20 different things that need improved so it's quite amazing really and it wasn't so we didn't come with a plan and say this is what we want to do we very much said We've got some money, we have no plan. What are the things you want to do? And it, we got real good buy-in. Mm. And, what, and what did you do about the projects that were, so the Innovating Streets, as people probably know, is on streets and it's NDTA funded. What, are we, what did you do, what are the things that are outside of that? And, yeah. how, and how do you build momentum behind projects that aren't on a street or, or yeah. to do with traffic? I guess something that we, I'll let you talk about the actual things. Yeah. I guess something that's lucky is that you can really activate the community because we have that funding from NZTA um, that things are going to happen. And sometimes when people just see stuff actually happening in their community, it can kind of drive them a wee bit more. And so like, you know, if it's always been talked about that a street's going to be upgraded <laughs> and it just goes on for years and never gets upgraded or it's like 10 years later and it finally happens. It's kind of like here's something that's going to happen by June and it's like it kind of gives them that momentum they're kind of like oh yeah like this is happening cool that's all designed like what next and it's like those what next if you if you can kind of get them out of people before the other project finishes sometimes they just kind of streamline into one another and but we, do you want to talk about yeah, the I mean, specific we've, one <laughs> we've got two projects that have come out of the engagements and people are really passionate about which have really nothing to do with streets um, and so really can't, aren't really eligible to spend this money on. But one is just nearby, there's a bit of, I guess, a bit of barren land, soil, and the kids go in and they've always gone in and they make jumps and they use it as a pump track for biking. Um, and every now and then somebody somewhere decides, obviously it's dangerous, so they go in and flatten them all, which is the typical sort of thing that happens. Yeah. And in this community engagement, people kept referring to, we want to have something done with the pump track. And it doesn't really fit because it's nothing to do with the road. It doesn't really fit with the funding. But what we've now done through this project is the council have said, actually, there is some funding in a budget for this, which nobody locally knew about. Mm -hmm. We want you to help do it. We've got a group of people who are passionate. We've got engagement. And now it looks like something's going to happen. So it's come out of this project. The second one is um, we, there's a council library um, adjacent to our community. And they, there's a road being blocked off. And, and in this road, people have... It's kind of this big open space, which all that happens is occasionally people parking it and we get the old Freedom Camper. And people have said that, couldn't we have a market there? And, and over years, people have said it. In fact, I had a student project six or seven years ago, which came up with the same thing, we want a market there. And there's some blockage about it, but now it's created extra impetus because it's come out of this local community engagement with lots of people saying we want the market. The council are now talking to us about it. They said, this is what we need to do to make it happen. We've got a market nearby that actually wants to move there. So lots more other things have come out. The community is mobilized. There's some um, energy behind it. And I think some things are going to come out. But they're not really directly related to the funding from NZTA, but they're other really exciting initiatives. Mm. So I suppose it's the, the, the ideas that were on those boards that Ashley talked about. And, yeah. and a few of those projects which we couldn't fund or get funding through NZTA, but have got a whole group of people behind them now, yeah. which then has started to snowball into a whole lot of other things about doing up these barren yeah. dirts and turning, creating parks and things. And, and the eel. So we've got a, a river that just goes through the area. And um, people have said, there's, we know there's eels in the river and people say we like a feeding station for the eels. Yeah. And so that's come out in this engagement. So we've actually got all these other ideas and now there's some energy to do something about yeah. create eel feeding stations. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think for me, it's been the, 
getting the people with the passion behind those particular projects and not cutting them off. So yeah. often you, you know, they, whether they can't happen because of funding or, or whatever, but there's a lot of people who will be able to do stuff because they're, they're energetic about it, passionate about it, may have a background. So the person with the eel feeding station is, let's help you do it. Yeah. The bikes, let's help you do it. And I think that has been a real impetus to get stuff Absolutely. going. That's great. And, and that leads on to my next question, I think, um, uh, about government and local government in particular. Yeah. Um, Ashley, you don't have to answer this one because Ashley is actually interning at the council, so I won't um, ask you to do this. Um, but Simon and I can reflect, but... <laughs> I think I, I, I put here as, the, as local government, as, as a community perspective, uh, the greatest underutilized asset or the biggest obstacle. And I, I'd like to maybe unpack it a little bit. What, yeah. From someone sitting in a community trying to do things, what, what is the view of the council? And then what are some of the experiences with the council? So yeah, far? I would say, I, I would say many people who live in communities, the sense is that the council stops stuff happening. I suspect that's the perception. In this case, they, it's, it's a mixture, maybe. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're really good at saying this is a grassroots initiative. We've done the engagement, we've got the ideas, and now we're trying to push some things through. And some of them, they're saying, yes, we, this is going to happen. And then every now and then you'll meet something that's really frustrating. Like the biggest suggestion from our community was to reduce the speed limit. And there's some um, work going on about reducing speed limits around schools, etc. And we say, this is the number one. This can be done really easily, let's do it. And we seem to be hitting a blockage and we're not sure whether it's council or NZTA or what it is, mm. but it's frustrating because that's the number one. We want that done first. We, it's easy, it doesn't really cost much. You just put a few signs up. At least that's the perspective from someone who's not, I'm not a traffic engineer and I'm just sitting there going, why can't we do this? Let's yeah. just stop, reduce traffic speed. It's a good starter. Yeah. But the other thing that's really encouraging and I think we've done is we, We've got our, our city councillor is fully on board. We've been to meetings. He says, I'm totally behind all this. We've got our community board on board. They're all saying, well, we want this to happen. So I think it's making sure you go to those meetings so you've got your elected officials on board so that they can push at the points they can push within council as well. Yeah, and I think uh, from my perspective would be, um, we've, we have uh, an experience politically where there's a lot of support. And then sometimes, and it's always possibly in councils, is who you, who you hit, who you find. And I think the lesson here, I suppose, is if, if we're trying to unpack and do more of these initiatives across the country would be to building that culture and, and council where the front face is able to be open and engaging and actually then actually stepping into communities and saying what's going on because it's pushed us to think differently when we've had a positive experience and then yeah. we get the fire. But then when you hit a barrier, you think, man, we, we've got ahead of the council here. So we're trying to, <laughs> trying to sort of backtrack. Yeah. So... Um, maybe tell us a little bit, obviously this year has been pretty tough for the whole of New Zealand, as we know, uh, or the whole of the world really, with, with COVID. Um, with the COVID lockdown we had here and, you know, what, what has it done in the community here and what are some of the things that have come out of it and whether they're good or bad, um, and in terms of, particularly in terms of the, relating to this project as well. I mean, what, one of the things I think we've seen in all communities, but particularly, well, certainly I've seen it in, in our communities, lots more people being out on the streets. Mm. So when people were in lockdown, there were a lot of people walking and cycling. And when you have these anecdotal conversations with people, it's very clear they enjoyed that. They enjoyed getting to know their own neighbourhood. So I think there's a stronger sense of place and connection to the local neighbourhood, which then when you start talking about the conversations about how can we improve it permanently, people are really engaged. Mm. Um, one of the stories I think I mentioned to you is I was out one day walking around the neighborhood and I saw this guy. He looked like he was being a bit dodgy on the riverbank. I didn't know what he was doing. So I just went and chatted to him, as you do when you see someone being dodgy on the riverbank. <laughs> and it turned out he was feeding the eels and he was feeding the eels with bits of bacon. And it started a conversation about him going, like, I've noticed there's eels, I want to do something. So I think there's more awareness of what we've got in our communities, which is a really strong thing. Yeah, I was down in Invercargill for lockdown. So, um, small town um but i think it's the same thing is that as soon as people like you would see people walking around every day and where i live down or where my parents live down there there's a lot of older people in our community um and they i think found it quite difficult because they normally have their like three different events that they go to a day like you know they've got morning tv then they go for to the library every 
Monday lunchtime and things like that. And they suddenly don't have that. And it was quite interesting that a lot of them, I guess, learned our walking patterns and what time of day I went for a walk. So a lot of them would like pop out the door and be like, hi and stuff. And you'd like kind of chat. And I think that was quite nice because people did, you kind of learned who was around your community and who was doing stuff. Like there was um, one lady started a, like a herb garden along the front. And then it turned out that she actually, if you look behind your house, because I went, I stopped talking to her when we were at like level three or two and she was like oh come down my drive and have a look and she her whole backyard was actually a vegetable garden she's like yeah i never know what to do with it all because it's just me that lives here and so now my parents actually get free veggies and stuff from her when they go on a walk because she whenever she has extra now she just leaves it out the front of the garden and that's what i suggested to her i was like oh why don't you just put like a free sign out with some veggies in it and you know i'm walking by can grab some she's like oh that's a great idea i didn't know you could do that and i think the lockdown really kind of made people realize how important your next door neighbor is anytime, you know, like learn who they are. Mm. And I think um, one of the things I wanted to get into and unpack a little bit, this, that we, we heard this earlier in the week and particularly I think the first session about placemaking and, and it's, it's sort of a white thing in a way. And I think we live in an amazing neighborhood here and it, it is diverse, but people would say there's privilege, I suppose, and people in the neighborhood are able to engage in these things um, because of whether they're a strict experience or background or whatever that they, they do that. But how do we um, bring in parts of the community that haven't been engaged or don't engage in these things, particularly um, you know, from the experience in Beckenham, but I think obviously sharing across the rest of the country, how do, how do we share this action, which is actually quite action orientated. It's quite um, amazing to be involved, but we want people mm. who don't usually get involved and engage, engage. And is there some things that experiences you could share about how we do that? I mean, I think one of the key things we did is we, we went to the school. So that was a really good way to get into mm. the range of people there. I think we mentioned that we would like to engage with the older community and haven't done particularly. Mm. One of the things we've done as well is we've got, um, a member of our community who's Naitahu yeah. and he is we, we engaged with we've spoken to him really early and he's going to help produce a cultural narrative about our community so we're trying to engage with uh, Mana Whenua there. Um, in terms of other communities absolutely you're right I mean one of the things about I think one of the reasons clearly that one of the reasons we were successful getting this funding is because Mike particularly knew the systems mm. and he knew how to engage with council and so clearly more affluent communities have more um, community knowledge etc that allow them to do that so one of the things we're really keen on is that we use what we've done here to allow other communities and so Ashley can tell you a bit about her project and some of the stuff that she's doing which is one of the things we're trying to do so do you want to mention that? Yes I'm currently working on my master's thesis which is all around evaluating the relative strengths and weaknesses of different monitoring and evaluation tools to assess the impacts of tactical urbanism interventions and something that I'm really focusing on is that strength of being very low cost or very easy and accessible to people. Um, so what's the way that, you know, like we get so big and fancy with using like different camera technologies and all of that stuff, which is great. But for example, if you're holding a, a three hour play street, then hiring a 14 grand camera to assess how many people walk into the event isn't really a great use of money. Like it's a lot, you can pretty much either volunteer someone or pay someone to stand you and stand there and manual count people. Like it's just, it's just as easy really. You're going to get the same number out of it, but it's a much better use of money or a much better use of time as well. Um, so yes, I'm really trying to focus and unpack how and strip back what councils currently try and like push and use to really fit that kind of tactical urbanism feel of that it's quick and temporary and like low cost because especially projects that don't get large amounts of funding like we've been lucky with um innovating streets that there is some funding there so possibly like you know different counting tubes can be used and things like that but for a project that is really grassroots what tools can they be using to assess how well their kind of intervention went um which i think will really benefit in the long run so when people do want to pick up it's kind of like oh, it's okay, like using a Google forum is just as great as having some fancy like social pinpoint. It's like they're 
you can get the same sort of information out of people. But yeah. I think we're also keen to, to help develop a methodology that allows communities that don't have as much community knowledge to, to allow them to get funds and to, to, you know, how do you run these events? The events we ran weren't particularly complicated. And if other people can learn from what we've done. So I think we're really keen that, that other communities that don't have, you know, as much, aren't as affluent, mm. can get this funding as well. So I think we've kind of seen ours as a case study and you know, that yeah, seems to learn from, yeah. So um, what what have made some of the things, well, we haven't, we've, we've done some things here, but what, what are some of the experience of something that makes it successful, a project successful or unsuccessful from a community point of view, I suppose? which is different probably KPIs and things from a, a council or a consultancy. Yeah. We've, one of the key things, and this is Mike, Mike should take responsibility for this, is that we've tried to make our engagement events really fun. So what we chose not to do intentionally was to produce a four page document, email it around to people, and then tell them to come to the council and tell us what they thought of it. We intentionally called our events parties, we had barbecues and bouncy castles. Um, and so we got people along and also said, and we want to hear what you think of your community. So it was intentionally done to be fun. Mm. And we tried to tie them in. So we did one after school, one Sunday afternoon. So we did them at times uh, where we thought people would be free rather than 11 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, which yeah. you know, not anyone who's working got kids isn't gonna come along. So we've intentionally tried to make our engagement events parties um, and then get people along. Because once you get people there and they're having fun, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll do stuff. We, we did an event in Biketober a cycling event we ended up um with a bouncy castle again and a barbecue with <laughs> common, common beans and games we got things from sport canterbury they had some stuff there was a, a bowl, got a barbecue you know for the bouncy castle was free and then we talked to people about the ideas we've got so again it's getting people into fun places and then talk to them about what they want mm -hmm. and on there. no i think that wraps up i think um really creating a fun event that people come along to and although we have, I guess, an alternative motive for it, it kind of makes it more engaging. It sometimes brings different people out as well. You know, they're kind of like, um, like there were some kids that were walking, biking or walking down the street just randomly. Um, and they send a bouncy castle and they're like, oh my gosh. And they were like, can I please go on? Can I please go on? How much is it? How much is it? We're like, no, it's free, just jump on. And then it turned out their dad, when we started talking to him, his great, grandfather founded the BNA, so the Neighbourhood Association. His dad actually like started the pump track that we were talking about earlier for him and then his granddad had done something else and it was like this person has never ever engaged with us. Um, but it was something kind of drew, the event kind of drew them out and yeah now he's a great contact that we have mm. <laughs> and is keen to get involved in everything. So it's yeah sometimes making things fun and a, kind of all ages like we had the barbecue and we had some of our seats that we've been building so people could try them out. So there was something there almost for everyone. Um, like we didn't age restrict the bouncy castle. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so it's about creating something that's for everyone and then you can kind of generate that conversation while you're there. My other tip, My, Mike and I and Dave who started this, we all have full-time jobs. And so we, every, any bit of time is precious because it's our evening. So my other tip is get a student intern. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if you could approach, I mean, I, I actually, I'm, I'm biased, but you can ask Ashley about this, but I actually, I mean, to me, Ashley's learned a heap. I think she's had some fun. And if you approach, if you've got a university that has an internship program, I'd see if they're or, interested. Or your, or your uh, you know, the, the Polytechnic. The or the college, absolutely. There's a, yeah. there's a whole heap of good people. I mean, Ashley's yeah. creative energy and, you know, they were just to do amazing things that we just, couldn't even dream of half the time. So. And going into the schools, I mean, actually did quite a few hours in the school doing stuff, which has been invaluable. Mm. And if you're in Christchurch, just contact me. Yeah. But do you want to comment on it? I mean, you've done the intern. So you've got to say how fantastic <laughs> it was. <today. laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great. Um, <laughs> what else do I have to say? Um, no, I, actually, I have loved it. And the connections and like opportunities, I guess for me that have come out of it, have been so incredible things that I didn't even think like the other week. I spoke at the UDAC committee meeting, which turns out is actually a full council meeting at the council. Um, it's just a different person who chairs it. Um, so, and that's pretty much, and I talked about the project there and the monitoring and evaluation of my thesis. And it's something that I never ever would have dreamt of being able to do like in an intern, to come from this internship especially. 
So it's just, yeah, so engaging with local tertiary education, or there might even be a high school that runs kind of like a, um, a year 13 project sort of thing that they do. Giving them that creates so many connections for them and like more than you would even dream of because I wouldn't have dreamt that I've been doing this at university. That's for absolute sure. Mm. Well, that, well uh, there's a big question I want to ask and can placemaking and can this experience help us deal with the bigger issues we've got going on you know, around climate change um, and equity in Christchurch, there's youth unemployment issue, you know, high youth unemployment. Does this, is, is there things in placemaking that will help us deal with these larger issues well beyond what we can just mm. do here, but. Absolutely, I mean, one, I guess the project for Innovating Streets is about transport. And so any, any vehicle you can get off the road is good for climate change, it's good for physical activity. And so that's a starter. So what, what we're trying to do is make the roads I think what we're trying to do is make the roads safer so that people come out and use them and they reuse the space in different ways. So anyone who previously drove to the local dairy who now walks, is, if that's a good outcome. Mm. I think in terms of mental health, we know that, that if you interact with your local community, that's good for your mental well-being. You mentioned about youth particularly. I think for many people, they would say, we just want to get some of our young people off their devices all the time. And if they can get out into their local communities because the community it's, it's got lower traffic speeds, it's safer, they're exploring it more. That's got to be good. So there's a whole bunch of things. More people walking and cycling, good for physical exercise. The other example we've talked about is the, the resident, the older community, and how one of the projects we've got is, is building benches so they can walk around their community. That's got to be good because there's an equal problem about older people being stuck in the homes because they don't feel safe. And if you get more people out on the streets, you improve safety. So there's multiple benefits. I actually think Innovating Streets will be one of the best value projects the transport sector invests in because yeah. all these more difficult things to measure basically placemaking it's quite difficult to measure a metric and say this is really good good value but i think we're going to be demonstrating that it's fantastic value yeah and i think there's value in it as well like talking about climate change and things like that is um like councils and stuff like that you know deciding to do like shared pathways or cycle like se separated cycle lanes and things like that they're obviously multi-million dollar projects sometimes. So the use of tactical urbanism can sometimes be, is that the right place for the cycleway? So it's like, oh, we can test and trial that cycleway before it's a permanent thing. And I think that adds some value as well so that they can they can get the maximum value out of placemaking. You know, like if they start integrating placemaking more into their larger projects, there's possibly a greater outcome of those larger projects. And that in turn... I guess changes like if people are like, oh, that's a bad place for a cycleway because it takes you nowhere or like it's such a roundabout way to get there that I'd, I'd never take it. It's kind of almost like good feedback rather than them modeling in it and it looks great on the computer, it sounds great to engineers. And then it's like, but the people using it, are they happy with it? Are they happy with where it's going? And some people get swept under the rug a little bit or never hear about like consultation processes or they're just like, that's just too hard to engage with. But I think tactical in place making allows for like a almost like a friendly and more community based approach to like engage with council and the community and things like that. And and I suppose for me just to plug, I think what I've heard from some community members who say actually taking action and being part of it and being coming aware of the community. So we're being aware of obviously we have the mm. the river that runs around the edge of it. Um, and thinking, well, if I pick up that rubbish, that's not going to end up in the stormwater drain and then therefore end up in the river and then end up in the sea and, you know, plastic. So there's uh, conversations mm -hmm. about the bigger picture when people are thinking about what happens right here. And then I think the action orientated nature of it has helped people say, I can do something locally. I just don't have to vote someone in or do something and hope that they do the best. I can actually have that impact here. So whether it's walking, taking an extra trip, walking, yeah you know, um, picking up that little bit of rubbish, thinking about do we need more green space and more trees, you know, to, to help with carbon, all that sort of stuff. It's really brought some action out, I think, yeah. all the action thinking, the yeah. action engagement. So um, in, a, in a minute, we might, I might look at the, if we've got any questions that come up for these community champions, these zealous nuts. Um, do you, if, if you had the resources here, 
right at your fingertip is there something that you do straight away in our community is there something you'd change straight away? is it the 30k an hour <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't even need resources does it just I mean, need some signs i can paint them i'll make the signs myself no yeah. i think if we want that that's the one thing we want to change first yeah that's the one thing that everybody says that we just want traffic speeds down. Yeah, and, and it's, it's yeah. interesting. I think the feedback. So we, we the little story is we've been saying that from from the start. Let's come out from the start. Yeah. Do the traffic speeds, and we thought obviously the community wouldn't want that, but they have. Like I think the council exactly. would have expected if they come and did this that it would have been leave it at fifty, but the community is saying reduce it. Thirty and as well. Or 30. Thirty. Yeah. And and. And now the council and we think in detail having a discussion. How on earth do we do it? Has it been done? And we're thinking, you know, it's just as someone said, yeah. it's easy. So, so a lot of it's. I think that the reality to me is a lot of it's not about resource; it's about being empowered to do it. Mm. So the pump track. Yeah. I tell. I was talking to my fifteen-year-old son in mountain bikes, and I said, there might be this thing to the pump track. He said, I'll be there. I'll, I'll I'll be there with my shovel. We don't need money for him to be there with his shovel. We need yeah. permission to do it. Yeah. The, the, the signs. I know you have to have proper signs, but people are saying, I'm, I'll pay the sign. We don't need resource. We want permission to do it. Yeah, so yeah. a lot of it is permission. Of course, money, some of the other things, of course, you need some resource, yeah, but yeah. actually a lot of it's about being empowered yeah. to do stuff. Yeah. And is there anything you're, so Ashley's been working in the school, as she said, with <coughs> these amazing kids. Um, is there anything the kids you think would want, if you represented them now, what would they change I, or do in the neighborhood? I think speed's one of them but I think almost creating a child-friendly community hub. So there's a space beside um, one of the shops, um, Hedy's, that's kind of like a gravel patch. Um, but I think if that space was activated for children, you'd find a lot of people down there most days of the week or even just, it's, um, it would cut almost all three of the schools actually that are around the neighborhood would probably almost walk through that intersection. Um, but I think if there was like, um, you know, chalk there, the wall was painted with blackboard paint, there was some seats, maybe they were allowed to, you know, like borrow um, outdoor play stuff from the shop that's there and like, you know, they had a community bin that sort of sat there with heaps of games inside of it. I think things like that and being able to bring down their scooter ramps, all of those sorts of fun things. I think sometimes we try and make parks and stuff, but sometimes it needs to be almost like an open play space. So you can use the space for whatever you want. I think that's what, when I think of all of their ideas, I think that's kind of something that would all 15 of them would be like, yes, yeah. because I can chalk paint, I can do whatever. I think, and I think when we had them down, the kids yeah, down, yeah. it was much less formal. I think the, the park, we've got, a, we have a nice local park in the river and it's all planned, you know, it has a playground and it has a space, but a lot of their ideas are, uh, way out there and incredible and it's, mm. it's much less formal and it's mm. much more dynamic and we miss that a lot in the in the planning and designing of things it's yeah all set. so this this is allowing that i'm just going to get up to the screen for a second and check if there's some chat because i see the chat but i can't read it from here because i'm blind mostly so forgive me so forgive me just quickly um uh is th is there a place for guerrilla action in the mix so no permission just, just well, we, doing said, we can mention the guerrilla action okay well, yeah. <laughs> there was some guerrilla action which actually it had an impact so we've got one street which um is right on the edge of our, our kind of area which um separates the school zone so the, the about a third of the school has to cross this particular road uh for years people have said it's too difficult we need a crossing point um and so one night somebody went and painted it on the street and obviously the council did not like this, the idea that you'd have a, it was a zebra crossing, they painted it on, um, and, and the council, somebody painted it off the next day, but it really mobilized the community and it raised awareness. And now the council has in their plans, a plan to put a crossing point in. Yeah. So I don't think they would have had that if that hadn't happened. And yeah. it got in the media, a lot of people were really excited. The community said, this is fantastic. Council said, this is illegal. <laughs> Well, and, it, it, and it, it is. And then, of course, two weeks later or two weeks before, a kid got knocked over oh, trying to cross the street going to school. So it was one of those where the, the community spoke very clearly that we need to cross this road. Somebody went out and did something. Council got crossed, but now they're doing something. So absolutely there is. There is a place. Well, and I think yes. the most interesting thing for me is the community had the school in the past have been talking about this intersection being dangerous. Absolutely. So one of the parents went and did this at night. And they said they've been talking to the council for five years about doing something. Yeah. And it took, so they painted it on, then it just took, and this is bagging all councils, but it took 
12 hours for the council to come and unpaint it. Unpaint it. So I thought it's amazing how yeah. quick it was to, to react it. to something when the, the school had been so frustrated the Board of Trustees for five years that there'd be no action, and so they did it themselves. Yeah. And I think, as Simon said, it's then stimulated greater conversation about the street, but I think it's a great question because I, th I do think that uh, the sort of subversive yeah. action is, is really useful. Well, I've got, we've got, we've got a, I've, on our street, there's a basketball hoop and it's on the street and therefore it's not meant to be there, but the can no one's moved it and it creates, it is, it's a place making, it's a, it's a place making initiative. It's a bumping space. Kids are always out there yeah. playing on it. It's yeah. not meant to be there. It's, no. It would never, if somebody did an OSH inspection, it would fail without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. But the neighbours now, other neighbours now come out and say, well, we can help fix this because yeah. the person who built it, it's not, is not very handy. <laughs> 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 and bolts are falling off and it's not very safe. But the neighbours are now coming, well, we'll help fix it. And that's fantastic. Yeah. And, I think, and I think one of the other things we have, the river, as I said, and there's, there's rope swings that <laughs> go and put, people put up across the river. So kids go... And then they'll get cut down and someone will go put another, put another one. Up. But but when we did the exercise of the they're talking to the kids about what they love, that the rope swings. They love the rope swings. Particularly the ones where they can swing across the river and jump off and land on the other side and then run all the way back around the bridge. But those things are just they've just generated so much attachment for the neighborhood. Yeah. And the council will cut them off from time to time, but the people put putting them back. But I think again it's generated a conversation yeah. about what's possible and could we actually have a permanent one that's done properly? Probably you don't have to come off. Um, every few months, so, so absolutely. I'm just going to check questions. Hold. Uh, okay, so good question. So, um, Mike, can I talk about the power and potential of finding a place for those inside council, working with those outside the council and all of us? So, um, I'll let you answer that one. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, you, can it. you can have that one, Mike. Yeah, uh, the power of well. I, I, I mean, that's a, this is so. I've, uh, my background is I've worked in council for many years. I don't at the moment. I don't. I haven't worked for for a few years now in council. But that's my background. And I think when I had worked in council, uh, one of the things I loved to do was trying to empower those outside. Um, and I always, when I do work with councils around the place, always encourage council staff to try the aim to unleash and build capacity in the community that's what i feel just mm. my opinion of what government is there to do and it is hard i think it is hard for those in council when there's a list of things you you must do and the rules and regulations to feel like you can't go and talk to an ashley or someone and say yeah just go and do it go and put the rope swing up and paint the crossing you, you know it's really hard so i think to those Inside the council or inside government, even if it's other government departments and things, I I would say having a a yes mentality or a yes, uh, we can find a solution to doing that is probably the first step. Mm. And the job I do at the moment, um, sometimes we uh, managing a market, I I find that we don't have that, so it's it's no first come back in a couple of years, and I think. As someone inside a council, if that's you, and and it's it's finding right, ha you know, taking that yes mentality because people like Simon or Dave is not here, or Ashley or Maurice or all the other community members who are wonderful around us here, they have an idea, and the hardest thing is is when it's sat on and says you can't do it. Mm. The idea might not work, or it might fly, or it might be a bit dodgy, the basketball hoop or whatever, but it, has, it triggers something much bigger. And so again, I think I think it's. It's just for those in council, just finding those ways or that way to say, yeah, let's work through this. And and I think, I mean, I, I have in my council career wrapped over the knuckles a few times for doing things, um, but I, the world has an end, I suppose, sometimes. <laughs> and, and I, you know, my performance review might have said, oh, it actually, you know, that, that happened, I remember that. But I think that the bigger, you know, the bigger picture or what came a bigger outcome came out of it was so much greater than um, being wrapped over the knuckles sometimes. So I, I'm pretty proud sometimes that as a council staff, you have all these resources and you have all this knowledge and how do you unleash that and share that and give that to the community so they can take it and, and sort of run with it. Um, mm -hmm. So is there any, anything else to add before I go to the next, have a look at the next one? Who's, what's Sam McPavey's role? Community governance. Yeah. And get, get to, I would say get to know your community governance person. 
We've yeah. seen some heaps of stuff. Yeah, so we have, we, have a, we have a great council person locally who works with our community board and she, um, again, I, I'm not sure if it counts Christchurch, so you can't, I don't want to drop her in it, but she's always saying yes. So for She's us great. locally, so whether it's, yeah, you know, we'll do the pump track or we'll help do this or that. And I think, to to, so. I think mm. other neighbours have said, look, I've been told no, no, no for many years. Mm. And Emma's just, yep, we'll find a way, we'll do this, we'll bring people together, we'll meet outside the council on site. We'll do, you know, it's, yeah. it's very engaging and empowering. And, and all of a sudden it changes the narrative of yeah. council being a barrier to council having a face. But she has a local role too. I think that's the key, isn't it? Yeah, local going place to central. She's a local yeah. person. Yeah. So that's the key. That's the key. It's come up. Uh, did you have to work with any businesses in the project? It's a good question. Oh, yeah. are we working with businesses? Do you know? Yeah, you can do this one. You? No, you can do this one. <laughs> we, you what, can what, do this what, one. What, what we did at the beginning is we, we noted down every single business. So it's a residential area. Ashley <laughs> got a map, noted down every organisation. Um, so we've got a cafe, we've got a shop, Hetty's. A rock, we've, a rock and a crystal rock, shop. A rock and crystal shop and a cafe. Uh, the cafe is new. Um, and so they are very aware that they've got to, they're still settling in. And so they're, they're having to be a little bit cautious because they want to make sure they play everything by the book because they're quite new. Etis has been them longer, more established. They've been really positive. So yes, we have. We haven't got many businesses because it's largely a residential area. The local butcher's been really good. He, whenever we have events, he gives us sausages at a cheaper price. Yeah. Um, so we've got good businesses and we've made an effort to engage with the key ones when we can. I mean, yeah. again, we're limited by time because we've got full-time jobs. So it's just, it's, it's difficult. But, and I think it's probably the network. I think the businesses have been great because they've, they've probably felt excluded from being, it's residential. So feel like they're on the outer, like yeah. it's a, there's, a, there's a, a residence association. So we're trying to change that. So it's a, it's a whole of place sort of governance, you know, everyone mm. can be involved in those businesses like the Rock and Crystal Shop, the, the, the chaps that run that are incredible. They give us free power for the Bouncy Castle and they're always now trying to engage. They want to put a, a screen, paint their wall and you know, sort of space we can have outdoor movies and things. But they, for years, have been trying things and kept getting knocked back again for their ideas. But now the sort of working mm. with the community, they feel like there's a bit of emphasis and um, impetus yeah. to, to get things sort of done. So that's very positive. Really, really great. We've engaged with all those three, three schools. We've engaged very actively with one. We've tried to engage slightly more peripherally with the others because they're more yeah. peripheral to the community. But yeah. Um. So Fiers just told me to unmute myself. So I have. <laughs> Because <laughs> my issue with the businesses in my area, and there are a lot of businesses, and it's a very busy arterial road in Auckland, is that what they want for road use, parking, etc., is the direct opposite of all the stuff that you're talking about that community normally wants. Like they want as much parking as possible, yeah. for example, and as many cars going through as possible, and to never have the street closed. Well, Whereas the community wants the opposite of that. So that, I guess that was my how do we. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to upset either side, but I feel more strongly aligned with the community side. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, think, I think my experience with that, and it's some in Beckenham and some elsewhere in the central city, it, it does take time to build that relationship with businesses because yeah. they have a certain way of doing business. You know, their business is all about, you know, I need to bring customers here and they need to be able to get as close as possible and then they need to be able to shop easily and then get out it easy. So, however... So I think I think a key to some of that, my, in my view, some work I've done in other main streets and places is actually building the time, spending the time to build the relationship, and then starting to talk about the value of using public space for part of your benefit. So I know that for us and the work I do at Riverside in the town, um, if you ever come to Crossroads Riverside Market, where it is, it used to be just a street and it's got a market, and now it's got a public space. There's only some cars that come through. But the owners of the land there now talk about they couldn't imagine the value of having it back as a road because of the value of, the, of, of it being a public space. Mm. And it's brought much more value to their enterprise and business that people can hang out for longer so they can spend more time. So if it's a cafe and restaurants, it's a little bit easier because they, they can put tables and chairs out and you can do really amazing things. And so there's one restaurant we worked with and they had a green theme, so they greened the outside took away some car parking and it became part of their branding. So, but it took probably five or six months to build that relationship to, to understand 
will help understand the value of using that space differently. Yeah. That the one car isn't necessarily shopping there. Um, and yes, you might make it hard, you know, it might be the perception might change, but you start to talk about where you can access and how you get into the place at the same time as adding value to that particular changing the value of that particular car parking space. And we've seen it a little bit around city here. Yeah. Oh, it's starting to change when people say, well, actually, you know, if you've got central car parking, you've got it elsewhere, why wouldn't I have my business out in the street? And then the council changing some permit, permitting rules. I know, I don't know if anyone from Timaru here, but I did some work recently in, in a tactical sense. You know, if they use the outside space, take away the table and chair license fee for a year. You know, just do it quickly so that they feel like they're being engaged and, and pushed to do, do something, um, which then changes the dynamic of the relationship a wee bit to what the business is being involved. So it is complex and it's not easy, but I think it takes that relationship to start with and then the helping to them to build and understand the value yeah. of the, the public space to their business and having people stay longer and having this amazing environment, which is much better for people shopping as opposed to just getting in and out as a transaction, you're, you're creating an experience. So yeah. uh, can, I, can I add as well, I mean, we, we've got another student into one of Ashley's colleagues who's doing a project looking at the impact of cycle lanes on business. Um, and um, most of the research is really clear that actually the presence of a cycle lane or pedestrianisation improves business. The problem is that the individual businesses who you say that to don't believe it. Um, and it, and it, and it well, on average, it helps them. There will be some businesses who it won't help. Um, who don't want, they, they don't get benefit from people being on the street. So there will be some. But I think another part of it is actually, I think one of the things that sometimes happens, and I guess I'm putting my university professor hat on here, one of the, other than my community hat, but one of the things that often we do is we, we say, here's a plan for a cycleway going past your shop and, and we're taking away your parking. And actually, I remember going to a conference a couple of years ago where a Buddhist guy said, what you want to do is go to the community and say, the business is what do you want your street to look like what do you want out of your street and so you're getting them involved and engaged before you come out with a plan that says we're taking your parking away and generally i think what we tend to do is we say we're doing your street we're taking your parking away mm. and maybe we should actually start by saying we've got some ideas we want to do something to the community in the area what would you like what are the outcomes and you're basically selling them on the big picture because most people want slower speeds uh, most of them don't want lots of busy traffic but they do want their business to do well. So I think maybe if that's possible, and I know it's not always possible. Well, yeah, I think that maybe this is another question that we've got to close up shortly, but um, I, I would say, and I'd always in council now as well outside, but talk about matching energy with energy. And and uh, it was, you know, privileged enough, I suppose, at Christchurch City when I did work there, we would, if we'd had a business that talked about wanting to use this space outside the shop differently, a car parking space, we would go and do it immediately. That would generate a, a conversation. There'd always be a bit of a kickback. However, there would be some that would say, well, how come they're putting tables and chairs out or, or getting something out of this? Um, that then started a conversation, well, we're doing that because they're showing energy and initiative. And actually, we, it's, it's picking a winner in a way. We're working with someone who's doing something interesting. And then they, others, you know, there, there's probably a third who will never change, you know. <laughs> And then there was a third who are in the middle on the fence and there's a third who, who want to do something different and it's trying to support the, that, that third at one end to get the others, which then creates quite a different environment. And, and, and I, I think we saw some of that and you'll, you, you know, there's stuff around Christchurch, there's stuff I worked on Rosie and it's that same matching energy with energy, saying to people, yes, we'll do that, which others say, actually, how come they get all the attention? I want some of that and I want to be part of that. And particularly for businesses, um, they're saying, well, how come they've got tables and chairs out when I could put that out? Or how come they can put a rack of clothing out and somewhere to sit and, or music or whatever it is, and all of a sudden that changes the dynamic of the relationship quite a bit. Because you can say as a council, we're actually supporting those who do. You know, we're, we're not waiting. So I know, I, I know um, we're getting to the end. I just... Um, I think we can have just this one final question and then we'll need to wrap up. Yep, good. So thank you, Sophia. So last question. So did it take time to get the school students on board or did they catch the vision straight away? Uh, Damien lives next to a school. They have ongoing traffic concerns, um, but they've never had any engagement with neighbours and seem to have a loyalty to unhappiness instead of trying to create change. So what, what, what did you do with the school? Um, I guess like, first off, we've been off 
uh, we went to the school and we talked to the, um, one of the deputy principals and the principal and things like that. And what the deputy principal did was they kind of picked almost, um, it was like an extended learning group. So I had about 16 students that the school had chosen and they were all kind of out of the box thinkers that sometimes, you know, reading and writing isn't their strong point, but it's, they have so many creative ideas and they just like buzz. Um, and I guess I've worked with them probably over a good 12 sessions. So we started off with some really like big picture thinking of their neighborhood and we started to slowly break it down and down into, um, you know, like for example, our project, we had, to, we had some restrictions with NZTA funding, um, you know, that things had to be temporary. So um, yeah, there was, I can't even think of the big idea, like putting bubble guns out on the road. So if you're speeding that um, bubbles would fly onto your car. So then you couldn't see, so you'd have to slow down, um, which is a bit of the safety concerns, obviously. Um, so it's kind of, I just let them go, mental at the start of how they thought that they could slow down the speeds and then started to, I guess, not restrict them, but kind of bring them, ground them a wee bit. Um, and they came out with super deliverable ideas that we're kind of implementing. Like one kid was like, we could just plant veggies outside everyone's gardens. And then some kid was like, I want to plant boxes in the middle of the road. So I kind of like paired them together um, and now we're going to use planter boxes in our like chicanes and they're going to have veggies in them and things like that. So people, um, it creates almost like a hub. So when you're all going down and grabbing some bit, like, you know, some herbs or something like whatever meal you're making. And then there's, yeah, they've just kind of taking them, going in there and talking to the principal and then almost like taking them through a journey, but not at the start being like, it has to look like this and it has to be on the street and it has to be, everything taking them to a real real big picture of their ideal street and their ideal world mm. kind yeah. of is like how you can build them and I, and I think there's been a good communication i think practically so actually being in there and being present and then us talking to the principal and dp mm. and trying to keep them abreast of everything inviting them to community board meetings mm. so that they feel it's a partnership because yeah. i think sometimes the school feels that they've been hammering to the council about something like they had with this traffic and we've been saying we're actually you know, be part of this community. The kids all live here, or we mm. have kids go to the school or whatever, and be part of that and then communicate with the leaders in the school constantly so that they feel like it's a, a real partnership's been key. I think, I think we probably have to leave it there, Sophia. So thanks everyone from, from all the time in Christchurch. It's lovely to see you, very comfy. And um, <laughs> we look forward to hosting you down here. If you're ever down here, we're happy to show you around the neighborhood and, and talk more about what's going on. So, ka kite. Can I just jump in too and just say thanks to everybody as well, because this is the last of our Ako Ako for the week, which we launched Placemaking Aotearoa as a little series to do that. Um, Placemaking Aotearoa, you can see it. Sophie, if you could put the link in the chat, that would be awesome, placemaking.nz. It's a collective. Um, what it is, what it can be is up to us. So join in. Um, there's email groups, there's a Facebook page, uh, a group maybe, LinkedIn. And contact us, there's an, an email there that will come through to me with suggestions, but mostly get involved. How do you want this to be? Um, yeah, and, and see where we can go with this so we can learn from each other across the miles um, and around the country. That would be awesome. Thank you again for coming to one or more of these this week. And um, let's see if there's more. Do we want to close with a karakia? Because we woke, we started the week with a karakia as well. well. I might just say a final karakia and let us all go then, if that's okay. It's a very simple one. Unahia, <clears throat> uh, unahia, unahia ki te uru tapanui, ki a wātia, ki a māma, ki te nāko, te tinana, te wairua e te aratangata, koe a rai rongo, whakairia ake ki runga, ki a tina, Tina, homie, hui, taikie. Go well, everybody. Go. Atiwa.